Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 45, Young Adult Dystopias. So, if you're a late millennial or Gen Z, or if you have kids in those generations, and you haven't been living under a rock, Young Adult Dystopias are some of the most famous, or infamous, books of the last decade or so. I first talked about dystopias in episode 9, with the classic, tragic dystopias like 1984. I came back to the topic in episode 24, where I described how the genre shifted in the new wave to more traditional heroes who are outsiders rebelling against the government. Well, since the new wave, the traditional heroes in dystopias have stuck around. There were a lot of them in the cyberpunk movement of the 80s, but in the 2000s, the focus of the genre shifted, and suddenly there were a slew of new dystopian works written for teens. Most famous of these, of course, was The Hunger Games. It wasn't the first, but it was the one that turned it into a worldwide phenomenon. For a few years, it seemed like you couldn't shake a stick without hitting another YA dystopia. The Maze Runner, Divergent, The Fifth Wave, The Giver, The Host, Mortal Engines, and those are just the movies. The thing is, it seems to have faded a bit now. In fact, I was hesitant to dedicate a whole episode to YA dystopias because they felt more like a fad than a long-term trend. Lots of people jumped on the bandwagon after The Hunger Games hit it big, but by 2018, with the Maze Runner films concluded and the Divergent films cancelled halfway through the last book, it seemed to have played itself out. Except, that's just in Hollywood. In books, the genre is still going strong. In fact, I once saw a whole section in a bookstore that was labeled as YA dystopias. Not YA fiction, not YA science fiction, but YA dystopias. It's still a pretty big deal. You can see it if you look at the Amazon listings, too. Much like children's sci-fi, I'm less familiar with this subgenre, so I consulted Amazon to make sure I was hitting all the major points, and that revealed the pattern. Now, once again, Amazon's categorization system seems more like guidelines. If you specifically search for teen and young adult science fiction, the top of the list is Percy Jackson, which admittedly is not a dystopia, but is also not actually science fiction. After sifting through all the dystopias and outright fantasies, only a few of what appear to be clearly non-dystopian sci-fi books come through, such as Brandon Sanderson's space opera series Skyward or Marissa Meyer's cyborg Cinderella retelling Cinder. And of course there's Ender's Game, which I've discussed previously. But on the whole, young adult sci-fi is flooded with dystopias. What's going on here? Not all YA books are dystopias, especially the older ones. Heinlein's Juvenile certainly weren't, although YA wasn't really a thing at the time. However, they do appear with alarming regularity. I've even heard criticisms that having so much dystopian fiction is unhealthy, especially for teens, with so much of their reading diet being bleak and pessimistic. And I've also heard criticisms of those criticisms, so you can make your own call there. And it's not like teens are limited to YA fiction. If a kid is a serious sci-fi fan, then by the time they're a teenager, they're going to be reading Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and Star Wars novels and at least one of the big three and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, probably some others like Jurassic Park. I mean, I read all of those books before I finished high school, and I feel like I'm an outlier for not reading Dune, Foundation, and Ender's Game until college. So what I'm saying is that YA books don't need to have a wide selection like children's books arguably do. If a teenager can't find what they're looking for in the YA section, they can easily find it elsewhere, while elementary kids might not be able to for multiple reasons. Arguably, this leaves more room for YA to slide into... I don't want to say lowest common denominator because it's not a quality thing. Some of these books are quite good. But I definitely feel like there's a bandwagon effect in play. It seems really skewed compared with sci-fi as a whole. So, to recap the genre... Dystopia literally means bad place, and was coined as the opposite of a utopia. It was coined in its current form by John Stuart Mill in 1868, and it usually refers to a work of fiction built around a tyrannical or oppressive society, often tyrannical in fantastical ways, and, to be properly science fiction, with futuristic technology. Although there are exceptions. And note that I said society rather than government. In a cyberpunk dystopia, the world is frequently ruled by megacorps, while the actual government is absent or at least impotent. But it still counts as a dystopia. Now, as I've discussed at length before, the classic dystopias like 1984 are tragedies, 
which feature a protagonist who is relatively privileged in their society, falling into rebellion and eventually being crushed by the state. These early stories were also the clearest warnings about the direction the authors saw society moving. They were things that could happen in the future if we stayed on our current track. Later dystopias, and not just YA, moved away from both of these tropes. They tend to focus on the rebel who is a traditional hero, who starts at the bottom, fights against the state, and ultimately succeeds, either on a personal level like of Fred escaping Gilead, or on a societal level, like Katniss Everdeen overthrowing the entire capital of Pan Am. And this is our first clue to why teenagers like these kinds of stories. Think about the teenage stereotypes of feeling misunderstood, chafing at authority, and wanting to be popular and important. What kinds of stories are they going to like? A teenager overthrows an oppressive government? Sounds like a good start. But that's pretty shallow on its own. I want to dig deeper into it because I think there's more to it than that. So let's try to look at the themes of YA dystopias and piece together what's really going on. First, later dystopias often are not warnings about where society is going. They may be allegories, and they may even call out specific trends. Reality television is one I've seen several times. But they're not plausible or at least probable futures from where we are now. Margaret Atwood actually wasn't trying to warn about the rise of a neo-patriarchy when she wrote The Handmaid's Tale. She was trying to construct one that would be compelling for the story, drawing inspiration from oppressive regimes around the world, both past and present. There is a warning in there, but it's a much more general warning about how easily society can slip into a dictatorship and to stay vigilant against it. Many of these stories are inspired by real-world events, often historical events, but they aren't trying to be prophetic just to tell a good story. And the classic example of this in YA is going to be The Hunger Games. The Hunger Games, written by Suzanne Collins in 2008, is set in a future North America that has been ravaged by climate change and later a war that subjugated the 12 outlying districts under the cruel and decadent capital of the nation of Pan Am. As reparations for the war, each year, every district must send one male and one female teenager to participate in the Hunger Games, where they battle to the death on live television. And you probably know the story. Katniss Everdeen volunteers as tribute in place of her sister and wins the games, but her symbolic star power rises so high in the process that she eventually becomes the figurehead of a revolution. Honestly, the plot's not that important. The important thing is Collins' inspiration for the story. Collins drew on three clear sources of inspiration, which honestly you may be able to guess just from that one paragraph summary. First was the Greek myth of Theseus and the Minotaur, in which the wicked king Minos of Crete forced Athens to send him seven male youths and seven maidens every year as tribute to feed to the Minotaur in the labyrinth. This, of course, became the tribute system of Pan Am. Perhaps even more obvious an inspiration is the Roman gladiatorial games, in which slaves and prisoners were forced to fight to the death in front of a cheering crowd. Indeed, the decadence of the capital is based very much on the decadence of Rome in the 1st and 2nd centuries. In fact, if I remember correctly, the name Pan Am is based in story on the satirical description of pacifying the people with Panem et circenses, bread and circuses, which would make it an extremely self-aware dictatorship. And Collins's third inspiration was reality television. You could argue that people engaging in cutthroat and often kind of dumb competitions on TV, edited and played up for maximum drama, is sort of the modern equivalent of bread and circuses. Although Collins claims that she got the idea from seeing reality TV juxtaposed against news coverage of the Iraq War. So the message was a bit less allegorical there. However, this is actually something that comes up a lot in dystopias. It's been a trope going all the way back to the 70s with Rollerball and Death Race and maybe all the way back to Richard Connell's The Most Dangerous Game in 1924. Sometimes, YA dystopias, while not warnings, are at least allegorical. Neil Shusterman's Unwind series is one of the few major works on the list that predates The Hunger Games, being published in 2007. And Unwind is very much an allegory for the abortion debate. The premise is that the United States fought a second civil war over the issue of abortion which, while not as divisive as it is today, still felt pretty divisive in the mid-2000s when the Christian right was ascendant. After the war, a compromise was reached in which abortion was outlawed, but children aged 13 to 18 could be retroactively aborted by being unwound. 
Unwinding is a euphemism for harvesting them for organs. But the clever bit is that every part of the body is used, including the brain, in pieces. So it's not technically killing them. Now, to me, that sounds incredibly tone-deaf to both sides of the debate for reasons that should be obvious. But maybe I'm failing to appreciate the allegory because I haven't read the book. It did get good reviews. Although, for the record, that is not how tithing works. Anyway, the point is that some of these stories are allegorical, but they're treated in a more stylized or fantastical way than something like We or Fahrenheit 451. The flip side of this is that sometimes an author just wants to tell a good story, and doesn't need any deeper significance to it. An example in this category is The Maze Runner. Written by James Dashner in 2009, it tells the story of a group of boys who wake up with no memory in the middle of a giant maze, miles tall, made of concrete, constantly changing, filled with monsters, and apparently built as an incredibly complex puzzle for them to solve, although they have no idea why. We eventually learn that the whole thing is some kind of medical experiment to find a cure for a virus, but as far as I can tell without reading the series, it doesn't seem to explain what the point was. But the main thing is, the inspiration for it was completely different. On his blog, Dashner explains where he got the idea for the Maze Runner, and unlike Collins or Shusterman, it just sort of came to him. Quote, I went to bed, and somehow this idea popped in my head about a bunch of teenagers living in an unsolvable maze full of hideous creatures in the future in a dark dystopian world. And later, quote, I thought of it as Lord of the Flies meets Ender's Game meets Holes, unquote, which is quite the combination. So, in other words, a dystopian story, especially in YA, doesn't really have to mean anything. It doesn't have to involve real-world issues to be relatable although many of them do. Much like cyberpunk, it's become almost an aesthetic style of story, one with which it has a fair bit of overlap. As I see it, it kind of feels like how westerns became associated with themes of law and order and justice and revenge set in an unorganized frontier society. Dystopias are about themes of power and oppression and rebellion and social breakdown, usually set in a quote-unquote bad future. In fact, this idea of a bad future is itself a major theme of dystopias, and not just on the shallow, oppressive government level. Post-apocalyptic stories are often called dystopias themselves, but a great many dystopias at least have an apocalyptic backdrop, either through a nuclear war sometime in the far-off past, or an environmental collapse that leaves the remnant society scrambling for resources. The Hunger Games has both. Unwind has a war. The Maze Runner has solar flares causing environmental disaster, followed by a global plague. Some, like Neil Blomkamp's Elysium, aren't post-apocalyptic per se, but still show a civilization breaking down and left to rot. And these don't have to be likely bad futures, like in the classic books, or even allegorical ones. Instead, they can be symbolic of our fears and uncertainties about the future in general. Mark Fisher, author of Capitalist Realism, remarks on watching Children of Men, quote, It is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism, unquote. It's a quote that he himself doesn't know the source of, but he considers it very apt. And it's easy to imagine the economic uncertainty of the past 20 years, with 9-11, the Great Recession, and now COVID, being transferred over to stories about the breakdown of society. He also describes Children of Men as the slow cancellation of the future, something that I'm pretty sure applies more broadly than showing a literal population crash. Actor Theo James, who played Tobias in the Divergent films, has spoken about young people's fascination with dystopias, connecting it with uncertainties about climate change. He notes that climate change has become a large part of our conversation and increasingly visible in the present day, and says, quote, It's so much a part of everyday life that young people inevitably, consciously or not, are questioning their futures and how Earth will be. Unquote. In a time of deep uncertainty like today, stories where people survive, overcome, and even reform a failed future society are going to look very appealing, especially to idealistic teenagers. Is idealistic the right word here? In this context, I think it is. Remember, as bleak as these stories are, they largely have traditional and successful heroes. On the other hand, also common in YA dystopias are themes that will be of specific interest to teens. Remember what I said at the top, feeling misunderstood, chafing at authority, and wanting to feel special and important. Those don't always have to be about leading the revolution. 
they can be much more personal, especially when you consider that there's at least one other theme that I missed, which is romance. A friend of mine who's deeper into this stuff than I am once described the Hunger Games as having a similar premise to Twilight, of all things, which she said was, what if a 16-year-old girl's love life mattered? And this is eerily accurate, at least for some of these stories. In The Hunger Games, Katniss's love life literally has life-or-death consequences. She's become a symbol, and due to circumstances beyond her control, if she's seen with the wrong boy, it breaks the symbolism, which could make the government mad in Book 2, or derail the resistance in Book 3. It's not the only thing that makes the government mad, but it's a big one. And The Hunger Games isn't even the most blatant one. By far the most popular YA dystopia I hadn't heard of before was The Selection by Kira Cass, which is a dark twist on the Cinderella story and the biblical story of Esther, in which a prince holds a glorified beauty pageant to find a wife. Again, we can also see the connection to reality TV. The titular Selection leads a less-than-enthusiastic commoner girl to find herself in an uncomfortable position among the elite in a repressive society with a rigid caste system. And it does make sense, especially in a dystopian story. A 16-year-old girl's love life is one of the most important things in the world if you're a 16-year-old girl. So it's not surprising that stories where it has earth-shaking consequences are popular. Plus, a 16-year-old girl's love life isn't fully her own, since parents are usually involved. So it's not surprising to see stories where an outside force is controlling it even if scaling it up to Coriolanus Snow saying, make me believe it, is so exaggerated as to seem farcical in isolation. Maybe an even clearer example of themes specifically relevant to teens is Uglies by Scott Westerfeld, which is notable for being another early example from 2005. In Uglies, beauty is held up as the highest value. All children become uglies when they turn 12 because they're no longer cute kids and have all of the physical imperfections of puberty. At age 16, they're subjected to cosmetic surgery to give them perfect physical health and beauty, including some bionic enhancements, and become pretties. But unbeknownst to most, the government also uses the surgery to modify people's brains to make them easier to control. So, yeah. This is on the nose even by YA dystopia standards. There's one other interesting subcategory of YA fiction I noticed that isn't exactly dystopian, but I consider dystopia adjacent. These are books where a teenager has supernatural powers of some kind and is being hunted by the government or other bad guys for it. I'm less familiar with these, but the most famous is probably James Patterson's Maximum Ride series, which is about a group of kids who have been genetically modified with bird DNA to give them wings and who call themselves the Flock. In this case, they were created by an evil corporation rather than the government. Maximum Ride is the actual name of the protagonist, who is the leader and oldest of the group. The flock escapes the scientists who created them, but the corporation wants them back, and they send human-wolf hybrids called erasers to hunt them down. Eleven books of drama ensue, continuing three past the one titled The Final Maximum Ride Adventure. You can find a number of other stories in this category, such as I Am Number 4 and Michael Vey, but it's still a minority of the genre. Okay, after all this, I do still need to talk about the history of YA dystopias. It's not that long, Suzanne Collins kind of reinvented the genre, but there were a handful of notable precursors. The earliest YA dystopia most people have heard of is probably A Wrinkle in Time, even though that wasn't exactly the main focus of the book. But there's actually an even earlier example that I've mentioned a couple times before. The Chrysalids by John Wyndham, better known for Day of the Triffids and Village of the Damned. And, in fact, it falls into both the dystopia category and the kids with special powers category. The Chrysalids is a 1955 children's novel, or boys' book as it would have been called at the time, about a post-apocalyptic dystopian society where the correct physical appearance is strictly enforced. Probably something of a combination of the legacy of World War II just ten years prior and the new fears of nuclear war. You see, in the story... After a nuclear war, genetic mutations caused by radiation caused great damage to society. So the government established rules for the correct form of the human body to guard against propagating those mutations. However, over time, these rules have grown so strict that they've taken on a religious meaning, and anyone with the least physical abnormality is either killed or driven out of the community. The protagonist, David, 
is one of a group of nine children who have a secret mutation. They can communicate with each other telepathically. Although it's not a visible mutation, they will still suffer the same fate if they're found out, which inevitably happens due to various accidents and betrayals. Thus, David and the others have to try to escape the community to another country where they can live in peace. I thought The Chrysalids was a pretty good book. Although, as children's sci-fi goes, as I explained in the last episode, the genre didn't really come into its own until the 90s, so it was something of a one-off. I mentioned A Wrinkle in Time in episode 28 about children's sci-fi during the New Wave. And I also mentioned John Christopher's Tripods, about boys escaping and later fighting against alien tripods that have taken over the world. Both of these were products of the 60s, and did start off full series, but they still weren't part of a larger trend. That began to change in 1993 with Lois Lowry's The Giver. This was a big one when I was growing up, although for whatever reason I never got around to reading it until recently. It won a Newbery Medal, which is a big achievement for a sci-fi book, and while I can't say that it inspired the craze of YA dystopias of a decade later, it certainly feels a lot more connected than the earlier examples. In The Giver, the community is a completely artificial environment of perfect conformity. There are no memories of the past, no knowledge of the outside world, and even no color. Children are genetically engineered and assigned to parents, and they are assigned jobs in the community at age 13. Which seems to be another common theme of YA dystopias, not having control over one's life and career. Also, unbeknownst to most of the community, elderly and excess population are not released, as everyone says, but secretly euthanized. All of this is done to protect the physical and emotional security of the community, obviously at great cost. When one boy, Jonas, comes of age, he is assigned a special job as the new receiver of memories. The receiver is the only person allowed to have knowledge of and books about the past, or learn about the community's secrets, and is the only one who can see color. The receiver also seems to have some supernatural role in enforcing the conformity of the community as memories lost from a receiver are scattered to everyone else, causing them great distress. Jonas begins acquiring memories from the old receiver, who calls himself the Giver, but things come to a head when he learns about the people who are killed by the community and decides with the Giver's help to leave, forcing the people to confront the memories. The Giver is a much more stylized story than most of the others. Borderline fantasy, in fact, which earned it some criticism for breaking suspension of disbelief but it's still a beloved story, and I think it holds up pretty well. And finally, we come back around to the beginning. The earliest book of the current YA dystopia craze seems to be Philip Reeve's Mortal Engines from 2001. Mortal Engines was set hundreds of years after a war involving superweapons that rendered much of the Earth unlivable. To survive, humans dismantle cities and put them on wheels so that they can roam the land looking for resources. I feel like there are some parallels with James Bush's cities in flight here. The main way these so-called traction cities get resources is by eating each other, in a practice known as municipal Darwinism. As an aside, back when the movie came out, I wrote a blog post about whether municipal Darwinism could possibly work, assuming you could move a city to begin with. The answer I came to was just barely. Link in the description. In Mortal Engines, Tom Natsworthy, an apprentice historian, lives in the great mobile city of London. Until one day, a girl from a prey city named Hester Shaw tries to kill Tom's boss, Thaddeus Valentine. Hester escapes, and Valentine throws Tom out of the city after her to keep his secrets, after which Tom is forced to confront everything he thought he knew about Valentine and traction cities in general, and decide whether to stand with London or against it. Oh, and also Hester is being hunted by a Terminator-like cyborg from the war for mysterious reasons. I have to say, Mortal Engines felt a bit rougher around the edges than The Hunger Games, or even its contemporary, Harry Potter. It still has some of that 90s era, written only for children feel about it. Not nearly as bad as Animorphs, but still noticeable. Also, the omniscient narrator is a little bit jarring, knowing what all of the characters are thinking at once. I'm not sure if that style has become rarer today, or if it's just not as well done. Still, this was a very important book in the history of children's sci-fi. Farrah Mendelssohn considers it the beginning of the broader children's sci-fi renaissance, and I do believe it at least kicked off the era of YA dystopias, even if The Hunger Games is what shot it to superstar levels. After that, these kinds of stories became commonplace, 
and at least for books, it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is hosted by Libsyn and is available any place you're likely to be listening to podcasts. You can find me on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction, where I've posted a couple new astronomy videos, including one about terraforming Venus. I'm on Twitter at Sci Meets Fiction, and my website is sciencemeetsfiction.com. For my book recommendation for this episode, I'm going with The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. Maybe it's a bit played out by now, but it actually is a pretty good book and worth a read. The next episode will in fact be the last episode of Season 1. At least, I think it'll be the last episode. There's still a chance the script will get too long and I'll have to split it. Anyway, there will be a Season 2. The format's going to change a bit. I'll be doing fewer full episodes and more interviews, but I'll talk about that more next time. However, the main focus of the next episode will be the state of science fiction today, and the way the genre has developed in the past 5 to 10 years. Sort of a wrap-up of Season 1, now that we've finally gotten to the present. But there's still more to come, so be sure to like, subscribe, and stay tuned. Thanks for listening.